Hello everyone, welcome for the very first time to Mathematics for Liberal Arts. This is the first in a series of videos that I'll be uploading for the course, and since it is the first, I'd like to take a few moments right now to set up some expectations for what's to come in the remainder of the course. This class has been organized to take advantage of what's called the flipped classroom model, and what that means for us, briefly, is that rather than giving lectures during class meeting times, I'm going to be pre-recording lecture content and then distributing the videos to everyone to watch outside of class. During class meeting times, you're going to have been expected to watch the videos and then bring questions from the videos, from the homework and quizzes, from the textbook, from working with your friends where questions sometimes naturally pop up. We'll take those questions, we'll examine them, we'll try to make sure it's uh, more understandable and clearer how to solve the problem, and then we'll work together to solve the problems and make sure everybody understands the course content. In my opinion, this is an excellent way in which to teach and learn mathematics because it means that as an instructor, I can better assess what the class needs and what the students need by listening to them during class meeting times and addressing those needs head on. What this means, though, is that this is a course where you're going to need to be involved right away. You cannot sit back in this class and simply take notes. You're going to need to be engaged in the learning process, and in particular in your learning process, from day one. And in order to help you, I'd like to give a few recommendations right now that will hopefully help you start off on the right foot. The very first recommendation I would make is, of course, to watch these videos and a round of applause for having started out doing it right. But I'd also like to recommend that you take some time to figure out how many times you need to rewatch these videos as well. It would be absolutely swell if any of us, myself included, could simply sit down, watch one of these content videos all the way through precisely once, and then know how to work with the material comfortably. But the reality is that for most of us, we're going to have to watch the video two or more times to make sure that we are comfortable with everything. Right now, we are early in the semester, we are early in the course, and so I recommend that you take some time right away to figure out where you fall. Do you need only one time watching the video? Do you need 17 times watching the video to feel comfortable? Try to figure that out now. That way, as you plan the remainder of your semester and the remainder of the course, you have an idea of how much time to dedicate as you study to watching the videos. Another recommendation is you need to figure out now how you're going to be taking notes on the lectures. I still recommend you take notes on the lectures even though these are pre-recorded videos that you can watch and re-watch. Uh, how you take those notes is largely up to you. Personally, I like to annotate PDFs or else print out copies of notes and then write on top of them, listing my comments, my concerns, my questions, my own work. And with that in mind, everything that you're seeing in this PDF and actually all of the PDFs that I've put together for this course can be downloaded and either printed or annotated on as in PDF format if you so choose. They should be online now or they will be shortly. If that is not how you prefer to take notes, feel free to do it differently. You can take notes freehand. You can dictate to your phone or to a recording device. It really doesn't matter. What matters most is that it's effective for you. And while I know that lots of students wonder if there is a most effective method for note taking, the answer is that it really depends upon how you learn. For me, annotating PDFs and hard copies of notes is the best. You may find something completely different is true for you. So take some time now to figure that out so that later on you'll have an effective means of writing down your questions and your own work and studying the material. The third recommendation, the last recommendation I have for right now, is that you, whether you use this PDF for notes or not, download the PDF for when you're watching the videos and for when you're studying. And here's why. This whole PDF, as you can see from the table of contents, is laid out to be exactly like the textbook. The sections come in exactly the same order, and the material in these sections is almost exactly the material in the books. For the most part, the only difference is that it has usually been condensed, and sometimes the perspective is a little bit different from how the book talks about it. 
That means that this is going to be a fairly fast tool for helping you study when we're talking about homework and exams and quizzes. Uh, it also means that it's sometimes going to give you a slightly different way of thinking about the same situation, and that can be a major help to understanding the material. Another reason for downloading it is that I have worked to make sure that any of the text that you see in red is a hyperlink to somewhere in the document or to a resource online. So, for example, if I click on Board Account Method, Section 3, it takes me directly to Section 3 in the notes, and that means that it's easy to get around these notes and to find the material that you're looking for. With all of that said, I think we're ready to dive into the material for Chapter 1, and in this video, we're going to be focusing on Section 1, the basic elements of elections. Now, something that you're frequently not told about mathematics, which is a crime, is that mathematics is, first and foremost, a language. It is a way to communicate ideas between people, and it's a language which is specifically made to be as detail-oriented as possible. What that means is that when we start out talking about mathematical ideas and objects, we have to have a very strong foundation, and that's what this section is really about. When it says basic here, let me go ahead and actually write this out, where it says basic, what it really means is foundational. It doesn't necessarily mean simple. We have to set up a strong foundation to build all of our discussions upon. We have to make sure that when we talk about voters and candidates and tabulation methods, that we all know exactly what we're talking about, because otherwise communication breaks down and we don't know how to work on this material. So that's what we're going to be doing now. We're going to give ourselves a strong foundation, and that way we can actually do some mathematics of elections. The very first fact that I want to put in front of you can be worded a bunch of different ways. I've given one wording here. The textbook also has its own way of talking about it. It's a little bit more poetic, and it's on page three for those of you who are interested. It is a quote from a man named Tom Stoppard, and it says, It's not the voting that's democracy, it's the counting. No matter how you phrase this idea, though, it always comes out to mean the same thing. Anytime there's an election, votes are brought together as ballots and then counted, tabulated. How you tabulate votes wildly affects the results. In fact, it's very common for an election to have completely different results for every different way you can count the votes. Now this hopefully raises a whole bunch of questions in your mind, all of which I encourage you to write down and bring to the next class meeting. But I have several questions which I think are important ones and which I'm going to be using to guide the way we think about this material. The first is, what are the different ways in which we can tabulate votes? I've said that if we use different methods, we can get very varying results. So the question is, what are the different methods to begin with? Another good question would be, how do we actually physically carry out the tabulation methods? How do we do it? We're going to be seeing some examples of that. And the last is, is there a way of tabulating that is most likely to be fair? All of these are going to be very important questions, but I think that number three in particular is the most interesting. And it's one that we're going to have to do some work toward before we can actually answer it. We'll answer it in section 1.6. For now, let's move on and talk about some definitions that we'll need. These are terms, and this is terminology, we're going to be using it throughout the whole section, and I'm not going to read out everything on the page. I trust that you guys can pause and write down or read whatever you need. Instead, I'm going to give the Cliff's Notes versions. So, when I talk about candidates or alternatives, I mean the nouns, the people, places, and things that we can choose between in an election. They're the things that we are voting on or between as voters. And, speaking of voters, a voter is someone who gets a say in a given election. Now that seems pretty obvious, and in many ways it is, but you have to remember that some of these terms are a little bit more subtle than they seem. Voters, for example, is pretty subtle, because if you think about it, after some consideration, you'll notice that the election in question changes who the voters are and what the voter pool, 
I'm using air quotes here, which unfortunately you can't see, the voter pool is. So, as a good example, let's suppose we're talking about two presidential elections, but one of them is a presidential election for president position of a college club at the University of Chicago, Illinois, and the other one is a presidential election for the president of the United States of America. Those are two very different elections, and they have different pools of voters. Now, there is some overlap between them, but they are not the same. And so we can see that the term voter is completely based upon the election in question. So whenever we say voters, we need to make sure that we have an election either specified or one in particular that we're fixated on. So that way there is no chance that we can misunderstand one another. When we have candidates, when we have voters, the voters are going to choose between those candidates and they're going to record their preferences in ballots. I list a bunch of different ways that ballots can be thought of. They can be thought of as pieces of paper, electronic documents, counting hands, uh, putting pieces of paper into a hat, etc., etc. It really doesn't matter how the information is recorded. What does matter is how much information that is recorded. That's kind of the crucial difference between types of ballots. And for our purposes, there are three types. The first two are the extremes. One of those extremes is single choice ballot. A single choice ballot is a ballot where the voter only lists their top preference, their rank one, we sometimes call it, candidate. Then the ballot is turned in. It contains no other information. They're very cheap. They're very time effective. They're very simple, which sometimes is not as good as it sounds. After all, if you don't have much information, you can't draw many conclusions. On the other side of the scale, there are preference ballots. A preference ballot records all of the candidates and your preferences about them. So, for example, if I'm voting between, let's say, um, Kirk, Jean-Luc, actually I guess if I'm going to say Kirk, I should say Picard. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your dad. And uh, let's say Janeway. And these are all three of the candidates in an election. Then what I can do is I can assign my preferences to them maybe as follows. I'll say that uh, Picard is my number one, Kirk is my number two, and Janeway is my number three. When I turn this in on my ballot, this would be a preference ballot because it shows every single one of the candidates for the election and I ranked every single one of them from my first, Picard, to my last, Janeway. Most of the time we're not going to know exactly how many candidates are there and technically speaking there could be a lot of candidates in an election, although usually we're going to keep the number pretty small. So a lot of times we talk about there being N candidates, and we say the last place person has rank N. I'm going to put this here just so we all know. Whenever I say N, what I mean is a whole number. It's always going to represent a whole number, and it's going to have to be at least two. An election with only one person isn't much of an election, and an election with zero people is definitely not an election. Now, I did say that there is a third type of ballot, and there is, definitely. The third type is called a truncated preference ballot, and it's somewhere between the previous two options. Uh, whereas the single-choice ballot only recorded our top preference, and the preference ballot recorded all of our preferences, the truncated preference ballot cuts off our preferences. It asks for only a certain number of them. So I have an example here written at the top. We have 17 candidates, let's say. I may ask you, as the person in charge of the election, to list your top three preferences. Well, in that case, when you turn your ballot in, what you've turned in is a truncated preference ballot because you've listed your preferences, but you haven't listed all of them for every candidate. That means that it's a little bit easier to record than a preference ballot and a little bit more 
detail oriented than a single choice ballot, and sometimes it's a very good choice in elections, depending upon what we wish to do. We also have what are called outcomes. The outcome of an election is whatever happens after we tabulate all of the voter preferences that were recorded in ballots, and there are several types of outcomes we can expect. A winner-only outcome is exactly what it sounds like. We only find out who is the top preferred candidate based upon our tabulating method, and that person is the winner. A full ranking is the complete other side of the spectrum, kind of like the difference between single choice and preference ballots. A full ranking lists every single candidate and gives them a rank from the first to the very last, or from a position to the a very final position. And a partial ranking sits somewhere in between. It records some of the candidates listed in order from the highest rank to the lowest rank, but not all of them. Finally, last but definitely not least, we have our voting method, the way that we actually tabulate votes. And it's this idea that we're going to be focusing on in this chapter. Most of the other stuff that we've discussed just now either is kind of outside of our control or it's really only useful as terminology. But voting method we can control. Voting method separates the different results, the different outcomes of an election, and we can actually do mathematics with it. So we're going to be interested in voting method throughout this chapter. Now to give you some ideas about where we use these voting methods in real life, I have some examples lifted lovingly from the textbook. The first is the selection process for best pictures in the Academy Awards. It's kind of an arcane process that not many people are truly in on, let's say. But the gist of it is that eight to ten films are chosen as candidates or alternatives. And then voters who are part of a, um, a committee, I suppose, get to submit preference ballots ranking the films. The outcome is winner only, so only the winner is announced. And I recommend, as we're going through these, that you go back and double check you know exactly what I'm saying, because I'm going to be using the terminology we just discussed very freely. The next example is the Heisman Trophy. I don't claim to be an expert on it. However, the gist is that we look at Division I, usually, players, and we look usually at really glamorous positions, like quarterback and running back positions. The people who get to vote here, the voters are members of the media, past Heisman Trophy winners or voters, and then the public also gets to weigh in with one vote, which is determined by them writing into ESPN. The voters submit truncated preference ballots listing the first, second, and third place candidates, and, at the end of the day, the votes are tabulated by a method we call board account method, which we'll talk about in Section 3. A quirky example is American Idol. This probably is the textbook's favorite. It is pretty free-for-all. We have 12 or 13 musicians, and voters get to vote multiple times for anyone they like. Voters can be anyone. So that means that unlike most elections where it's a very specific and fairly limited pool of people who get to vote, and they only get to vote once, an American Idol, anybody can vote as long as they contact the American Idol lines somehow, and they can vote as many times as they want for anybody. Technically speaking, it is a full ranking outcome. However, only the winner receives the final prize. Most useful for us, though, is going to be this example. It'll be a recurring example in our work for the Tasmania State University, or TSU for short, math club election. In this fictitious election, we are trying to choose a president looking at Alicia, Boris, Carmen, and Dave as candidates. And we're going to be using this election to try to introduce a lot of our methods and to try them all out. Now, if you look down at the number of ballots here, you'll notice, because it is said at the bottom explicitly, that there are only 37 preference ballots. They are full preference ballots here. Hopefully, however, you have exactly the same reaction as me. Firstly, 37 is not a very large number of ballots. But secondly, I wouldn't really want to do this tabulating by hand. No matter which voting method we use, even though we don't really know what they are yet, there are too many pieces of information here in these ballots for me to comfortably 
do this all by hand. So one of the very first things that we're going to be interested in is how many ballots can we really have and how do we handle the number of ballots that we're given? Well, actually, let me go ahead and sharpen that uh, idea a little bit because it's not as clear as it could be. I say how many ballots could we be dealing with, but I want to draw your attention to something. There are 37 ballots here, but if I look at, say, the first ballot right here, which lists A first, B second, C third, D last, and then I look at the third ballot, well, they're identical to one another. And actually, hunting through again, just briefly, I see that this ballot right here is identical to the first two circled. These are three different ballots, different in the sense that they come from different voters, but they have exactly the same ranking. It doesn't make a lot of sense to think of them as being different, even though technically they came from different people. It would make a lot more sense, to make things easy, to put them all together in a stack, and that stack would be the stack that has only uh, rank 1 to A, rank 2 to B, rank 3 to C, rank 4 to D. If we look at it this way, what we're really interested in is not really the number of ballots, but the number of distinct ballots. And let me go ahead and clarify that word distinct really quickly. As a mathematician, when I use the word distinct, what I mean is different, and unique. So as I'm looking at these ballots, I see that the circled ballots, and there are probably more, are not different from one another. They have exactly the same ranking on them. On the other hand, the f these circled ballots are different than the second ballot in the list, which has B first, D second, C third, and A fourth. So technically, the circled ballots, and whichever ones have the same ranking, would be all thought of as being kind of the same, and unique, and ones that look like the second ballot here would be different and also unique. So maybe a better way to think about this situation is how many distinct ballots can we expect in an election? Well, that's a little bit easier of a question to answer, and it turns out that the number of distinct ballots is entirely determined by the number of candidates. So we have a fact here. We're going to assume there are n candidates, so in other words, n is a whole number, it's greater than or equal to 2. If there are n candidates, then if we are looking at an outcome of winner only, and we're going to assume that we're only using single choice ballots, there are n possible distinct ballots. And that is pretty obvious. After all, we can only vote for person 1, person 2, person 3, etc., all the way through person n. So there can only be n distinct ballots. If the outcome is full ranking, and we're going to be assuming we used preference ballots, then the number of possible distinct ballots is, well, this is called n factorial. And n factorial is found by taking n, multiplying it by n minus 1, then multiplying that by n minus 2, then etc., etc., all the way down to times 2 and then times 1. Why does it turn out this way? Well, actually, that's pretty easy to th see if you think about it the right way. So when I make my very first choice, I have persons 1, person 2, etc., all the way down to person n. So there are n choices for my first place candidate. Then, after that, let's say I picked person 1, there are 1, 2, etc., only n minus 1 choices left, because I already chose one person to be my first favorite, my highest ranked. And that's true for all of these possibilities as well. There are n minus 1 possibilities, no matter which one I pick to begin with. For each of those, there are n minus 2 possibilities, because I've already picked two people, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like looking at a tree branching, and as we continue that pattern onward and onward, we find out that it ends up giving us this formula. To give you a better concrete example, let's say that n is equal to 3. If n is equal to 3, then n factorial becomes 3 factorial, 
And using the formula up here, we would say, okay, it's going to be n, which is 3, times n minus 1, oh, that's just 2, times n minus 2, okay, that's 1, oh, and that's where we stop. So if I then multiply these together, I get 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. It looks a lot worse than it actually is. The last of these possibilities, this last formula, is one that I mentioned for completeness, but I don't expect you guys to use. Not frequently, anyway. As you can see here, this formula is a little bit more complicated. It uses the same ideas that we did before. The notion here is that we're doing partial ranking. There are n candidates we're choosing between, but we only choose some of them, which is what we mean here when we say that k candidates are selected. And the expansion that you see at the bottom, which is a little bit ugly, is really just me expanding the formula for the top and the formula for the bottom in exactly the way we expanded this n factorial before. To put this to good use, if you remember in the TSU Math Club example, there were four candidates. So the question is, based off of that, how many different distinct ballots can there be? Well, if n equals four, then what this means is we're talking about four factorial different ways since we're doing a full out a, a full ranking outcome we're using preference ballots so using our formula we would do n which is 4 times n minus 1 which is 3 times n minus 2 which is 2 times n minus 3 which is 1 and that's where we would stop and let's see 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, that appears to be 24. So apparently there are only 24 distinct ballots we would expect. Ah, but if we go back a few slides, there are 37 ballots overall. So what does that mean? Well, the circling we did already kind of hints at what it means. It means that a lot of these ballots must be repeats. There must be a lot of ballots, who knows how many, because I'm not going to do the full count, that look exactly like A, B, C, D in terms of ranking. And that's handy, because that means, as we already said, we don't have to treat them as being different. All we have to do is know how many ballots ranked A first, B second, C third, D fourth, and then we need to remember that ranking. That's what we're talking about here in this fact and the definition that comes after that. So, frequently there are more voters and more ballots than there are distinct ballots. And when that happens, there's going to be overlap. Once we have that overlap established, we can use what's called a preference schedule to clarify things. What we do is we take all of the ballot information that we got from the voters, and then what we do is we take all the ballots which rank candidates in exactly the same way and we put them together into a pile which records the ranking and the number of ballots. Then what we do is we say, okay, each of these piles of ballots that are the same is going to be one column in our table. The top of that column, the very top row of that column, will tell us how many ballots were in that column. And then the rows underneath in that column will tell us the ranks for each of the candidates. That's a little bit hard to understand verbally, so let me show you visually. If we take all 37 ballots from the TSU Math Club election and we put them into piles based upon ranking, the ABCD ranking consists of 14 ballots, the ranking C, B, D, A consists of 10, and so on and so forth. Then we take this pile and we put it into this column here. 14 ballots. First place goes to A, second to B, third to C, fourth to D. We take this pile and we put it into this column and this pile into this column and so on and so forth. This greatly simplifies the process and takes it from something which is difficult to work with and makes it into something relatively easy to work with. We're going to be using this preference schedule idea a lot. The preference schedule is useful to us for a lot of reasons, which I'm going to list here. It gives us a lot of information. The first thing is it gives us the number of distinct possible ballots. And if we go back here, uh, for example, we see that there are 
one, two, three, four, five distinct types of ballots. They look like either the ones in this pile, the ones in this pile, this one, that one, or that one. It tells us the number of candidates in the election, which we can easily get by just looking at the candidates in the preference schedule. And lastly, it also displays the number of voters in the election. Now, it doesn't do that directly, but what we can do is simply take the numbers in the top row and add them all together. So, for example, here, we see that there are 14 from this pile, 10 in this one, 8 here, 4 here, 1 here. So if we added all of these together, we would end up with the number of voters in this election. And if we're careful and we check this out, we're going to find this is going to be exactly equal to 37, which we already knew, but it's nice to be able to check it. The very last thing I'm going to leave you with before I conclude this video, which will be the longest video of our course, is that there are lots of different methods for tie-breaking, but we're not going to be super interested in them in this course. Any time that we have to break a tie, we're going to give you directions on exactly how to break that tie. It will be given to you in the directions for the problem. If you are interested in learning more, though, you are welcome to turn to page 9 in the textbook, and it will list a bunch of different possible methods, and you will also see some in the homework. But for now, I have taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much for all of your attention, and I will see you in the next video.